Hello, I'm Charlie Russo. I'm a broker associate with Remax Signature in Houston, Texas. Um, this series that I'm getting ready to start is going to be about the components that make up a home. I'm going to go from anything from the slab to the frame to the roof into other systems like air conditioning, uh, plumbing, electrical, and some uh, optional systems that most homes in our area tend to have. I I'm putting this together because I feel like a lot of homeowners, uh, even experienced and non-experienced homeowners, there are things that they just don't know what they are. And sometimes giving people a little bit more information can spark other questions. I hope you enjoy this series. All right, the first system or uh, portion of the house we're gonna talk about is the frame. Uh, what mostly makes up most residential homes is wood studs, two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights. You have posts, you have beams, you have parallel beams. Uh, every builder's a little different. Every municipality is a little different. So here in Houston, and we're actually in the city limits of Katy in a neighborhood, new construction neighborhood named Cane Island. And I'm standing in the middle of a, a, a Perry construction new home. Uh, the components of the frame and we're gonna use this fireplace as a simple, and I'll kind of point to some other ones, but you know, two by four or two by six construction. It consists of some pressure treated areas, these green ones like your base plate, sill plate, that's the board that runs along the base or side of the walls, okay? They run the exterior, they run interior walls. This builder's using pressure treated, but that green actually is a boratic acid treatment. So it actually is also pest control for them. Um, this is an example of a header. You have headers over doorways, over uh, large openings like windows and doors. This is a huge example of one. This is a parallel beam. This is a three panel slider door. And that beam is being supported by wall studs. These are two by six exterior wall studs on this home. And you'll see two followed by a third. This third one here is called a king stud. It actually goes from the base plate all the way to what they call the top plate. And that is carrying the load of the roof sitting on it. And then these is, are the jack studs or whatever they call. They, were call. they are carrying the load of that beam, which is supporting this huge opening for these doors. Um, and these you know, man-made beams are pretty expensive. One of the reasons new construction can cost a little bit more, but instead of putting, you know, six or eight, two by eights or tens to make these huge things, they use these engineered beams to carry a higher load. Uh, some other parts of framing in residential construction consists of, let's see, what did we talk about? We talked about the top plate runs the top of the wall frame, the base plate running the bottom, obviously. Uh, we talked about a header. We also have things like the cripple studs. Here's a good one. So over these doorways and openings at windows, doors, or like here again at the fireplace, you'll have these wood pieces that take, that connect the top and the bottom plate, especially over doors and windows. It's not just there for them to nail into the sheetrock so they have a place to nail it to. It, it's there to, to help carry that load space so there's no dipping or sagging. Um, corner studs are basically interior wall stud, the end that connects it to the exterior or adjacent wall. Again, they go top to bottom. Uh, some of the other components of a frame that we should really cover besides the corner stud there, we're gonna talk about blocking. So this home's a big one story. You have a high plate height. We're going 8, 10, 12, we're going 10 or 12 feet and then it vaults up. So there isn't necessarily fire blocking in this main area, but here in the entryway, you'll clearly see where they blocked the frame. In between each stud, you'll see little pieces of two by four that are basically jammed in there. Um, and then this builder is also using that orange foam seal, not just as a sealant, on the frame for air movement, but that orange indicates that it is fire rated foam. So it has a much longer burn rate, okay? Um, bracing, again, on a one story home, this one doesn't have a lot of horizontal bracing, but it does have interior walls that are actually shear walls. They have OSB plywood on an interior wall between the kitchen and this game room. 
that this is designed as bracing to prevent the frame from going side to side because the weight's pushing it down this prevents it from moving sideways um, and then some other things that generally go into framing you'll see areas for mechanical components normally on a two-story you'll see mechanical chases you'll see like an errant square in the corner of a room and it's like why is that there it's so they can run ductwork or plumbing or some kind of utility um, component vertically but on a one story you generally don't have those but like here's a good example of you know venting to the outside on this frame they had to box that out prior to sheetrock and cabinets but that utility component normally if that wall wasn't thick enough they would have to kind of fur it out or fatten it up to make sure it was flush um, these are many of the components of a frame in a home a few other ones that will lead us into the next portion of the series, which is a roof. If you look straight up here, we have this huge man-made Paralam structural beam that is basically carrying the entire roof load from one end of the family room all the way to the other end of the kitchen. They have boxed around or furred out around that beam, and you can see where they dropped electrical into it because they can't go through that structural beam or it will lose its integrity. So they actually boxed around it so they could get electrical in those areas for future, I'm gonna say fan in the family room and probably a, a, a hanging light over that island. So this is a good start for the components of a frame. In the next portion, you'll hear me talking about the roofing system of a home. All right, now we'll talk about the uh, roof, the component of a home. Uh, we're gonna start at the top and work our way down. Basically at the very top of the roof, you have a ridge board. It's, it runs along the, the ridge of the roof. It, it, it is where all of the rafters, that's all the framing members or the portion of the roof that supports the roof decking, that's what they tie into. Once you come down these rafters, they're being supported by a uh, collar tie. The collar ties run horizontally kind of supporting those ridge boards. And what those collar ties then are supported by is another framing component called a uh, purlin brace, where it's basically a two by four with another two by four on the back, kind of laminated on there, nailed on there. It's kind of like a strong bag. It, it gives it rigidity and it helps keep that supported. And those tie into the, the top plates of our frame. Those are the the, the horizontal boards at the top of the framing members of the walls. Uh, other parts of the roof system include things like uh, the notching out of materials into what's called a bird's mouth. That's where those rafters will sometimes meet the top plate, the exterior wall top plate. You also have the, the ends of each one of these gables are tying outside and they're gonna be wrapped in some kind of fascia uh, soffit material, fascia boards, and then, you know, generally going to be like a hardy plank material, something that's, uh, you know, not, not, not wood, and it uh, requires less maintenance. It won't rot, pest don't bother, cement board. Uh, other parts of the roof that we really should mention, this home has a fireplace, so you'll have a, uh, a chase that's built into a component of the roof, and you'll see that when you can see the, the fireplace coming up out of the roof on the outside, past the shingles and all the flashing. Um, bringing this mostly to the remainder of the roof from the outside components include flashing, shingles, there's an underlayment, something that they're gonna put on top of that roof decking as a waterproof or a water shedding. Some builders still use kind of rolls. Some of them use a, a really tacky material that actually kind of self seals once you nail that shingle to the roof decking. There are so many components to uh, roofing now to help protect people's assets because that's a huge thing, uh, especially here in the Houston area. Um, we don't get snow, but we get lots of rain and roof maintenance is one of the main things that can save somebody thousands of dollars just by every couple of years going up on the roof and making sure things are nailed properly, sealed properly. Um, other components of a roof specifically in our area will have to do with ventilation. So you'll even see where we use these baffles and these baffles run from 
they're nailed to the roof deck and they run up into the attic. That way airflow can move from the attic out and in, which keeps, you know, thermodynamics working. Hot air naturally rises, it goes up to that ridge. They have uh, ridge venting on the outside of the roof, which you'll see. And that allows hot air to naturally escape the highest point of the roof. These baffles extend into the soffit material, which has holes or perforations or channels in it to allow other air to come in. So again, thermodynamics, warm air is escaping, cooler air is being sucked in, and all of that works together along with insulation in an attic and the insulation on the back of the decking to keep the air that's touching your interior ceilings to be cooler. Here's some examples of some of the components of the roof that I have here that are being added to a home. So we have the covers that go onto the furnace exhaust or for a hot water heater, any gas fired appliance is gonna have a, a metal cover like that. It goes on a double wall metal pipe uh, that way, nothing combustible can get burnt up in an attic. It's a safety feature. You also have uh, these, uh, you know, the, the, these pitch kind of, you know, it's built for a, you know, an angled roof, but that way the metal pipe can come up through these, through the roof, and then this sits on top of that double-walled metal pipe. And then you have an example of, of, a, of what they call a, a rubber boot. Again, it, it's set for a pitched roof, so it'll go on an angle, and those PVC pipes, again, plumbing, it's mostly for uh, the vent stacks from the off-gassing of sewer gases from the plumbing system as they go through. And these pipe, these are designed to stretch and go around the pipe. And then, you know, again, from a roofing maintenance standpoint, these rubber boots, especially in our Texas heat, can get eaten up. So this is one of those points for water penetration that people really need to focus on maintenance over the years. Looking at the roof from the outside of the home, you'll notice that we have our fascia and soffit material made out of that hardy plank. You'll see that silver flashing above it. It's called a drip edge. That goes underneath the underlayment in the shingle. And then you have the shingles on top. And at the ridge of the roof, you'll see, and you can actually see it on a house next door here that's completed, that ridge vent. That's the venting to let the hot air out. And then these little perforated holes, that plastic H molding that's running in the hardy plank or cement board material there, that's what's letting the cooler air in that those baffles are allowing to, you know, thermodynamics to kick in. So you have asphalt shingles, you have an underlayment, you have flashing at areas. In areas of valleys or peaks and things, you're going to have uh, overlapping of shingles. Some builders will use metal or uh, tape style flashing, again, depending on what kind of underlayment they use. Uh, you'll also see things that come through the roof, the vent stacks. Those are generally for mechanical components, things like plumbing to allow sewer gassing to off gas, or the metal uh, ventings there are normally for gas fire material for like a furnace or for a hot water tank or something like that to allow that uh, exhaust to uh, get expelled through the roof and not into the attic. So those are the components that generally make up and comprise a, uh, a roof here, residential construction here in the Houston, uh, specifically the Katy area. Uh, in the next part, we're going to talk about plumbing. In this portion of the series, I'm going to talk about plumbing. Plumbing is, you know, you know what it is. We're bringing water in the house and we're uh, having drainage and taking waste out of the house. So plumbing components generally in residential construction here in our area uh, consist of PVC piping or the red and blue pipes, the PEX kind of piping. This builder does use CPVC. They're not using uh, PEX except at certain areas. So the supply coming into the house is being run from a water meter up towards the street in the city of Katy. And then it is dispersed throughout the house via, you know, different breaking points throughout. So as we walk through the home, you'll start to see things like bathrooms and you'll see components here in the kitchen, like the plumbing for the island, because the sink apparently is in the island here. And what you're seeing here is the in and out of the drain that's tying into it. We also have the supply for hot and cold water. Uh, they even have some electrical in there because in an island you're required to have electrical and it's there. In the back wall here, you're gonna see examples of a vent stack that's coming up again from the main sewer line. It's coming up, it comes over, goes out, and that will go up and out the roof. You'll have one of those roof boots going around that pipe. And again, that is 
again, allowing ventilation through the, 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 the roof of the home. In this bathroom over here, you'll see how it's set up for a vanity and a toilet. So you'll see the supply lines. You'll also see again, another vent stack taking it up and over. And it either goes through a different termination or joins with another. Uh, you can see where there's the water supply line for a toilet. There'll be a valve on that wall. And you can see where the uh, drain for the toilet is. And it's above grade. It's done like that on purpose when they pour the slab. And when they go to install the toilet, they'll trim it down to size and set their flange and wax ring. Um, other plumbing components in a home, again, and utility room, again, you're going to see the vent stacking, again, allowing the the sewer gases to escape through the roof. You'll also see supplies for water, hot and cold, but also a plumbing component is gas. Now this builder does not put natural gas in for a dryer unless you add it. But on this home, as you'll see in the garage back there, you'll see a large gas black metal pipe that's coming in. That's feeding uh, the furnace, that's feeding the hot water tank that's in the attic. Uh, this home actually might have a tankless heater. I'm not sure. Again, it might be an option with the builder. But when they put these components in, what they end up doing is they pressurize it. They generally put air in the pipe. They hold the pressure to make sure that it is actually uh, not leaking. You'd like to know if you're going to have leaks beforehand. Some other plumbing components, again, in residential construction, bathrooms, you're gonna see again another toilet and supply, but here's a good example of them pressure testing or leak testing a shower. They have used a PVC watertight underlayment for this shower. You'll notice that it sinks below grade. So the shower, when the slab was poured, it was purposely framed out and dropped down so that the shower would be below the normal floor grade. And what the plumbers have done is they put the underlayment They've sealed it up, attached it. Everything's supposed to be watertight. And what they've done is they've gone and put a kind of a balloon in the drain. They blew it up. They put air in it, made it tight. And now they put water in it. They take measurements of the height of the water and they check it at certain intervals to make sure there are no leaks. Again, with it being below grade water, it's kind of hard for water to kind of go up four or six inches. But once they add the the mud set, the tile, that floor won't be as much of a step down. It'll be, it's designed to be sloped, so everything goes towards that drain. And again, in a primary bathroom in this builder, they have a separate tub as well as the shower. Again, you're gonna come back to the supply lines, hot and cold. You're gonna see your vent stacks for all your drains. You'll see that the drain line for the tub is kind of in the center, it's kind of this way. This tub will be dropped in and it won't be touching the slab. So they will move and, you know, get the P trap and everything there for this tub. Um, they don't use, this isn't going to be like a jetted tub. So this is just a soaking tub. You can see how a vanity has been set up again, a hot and a cold line, again, a drain line. And then it, again, the vent stack going up. Um, and then, you know, there's another sink on the other side of this bathroom. Some other plumbing components uh, outside of the hot and the cold, you have your drains, you have your gas lines, but again, the water tank in this home is probably in the attic. It is a gas water you know, heater or tank. Um, some builders do use tankless heaters. Those tend to be either outside the home or in the garage area. Those also require venting as well as you know electricity and gas that will be the fuel for heating the tank. Um, outside of that, the drainage goes down through the slabs in these homes, but you're gonna have two things. You're gonna have exterior sewer cleanouts for many of the areas of the home. Uh, in the utility room, because it's centralized in the home, you're actually gonna have that sewer cleanout. It's right here where they've gone ahead and put a hose bib. This is a temporary thing. This will be flipped out and put into a cap. They'll put a metal plate on top of it. And then if you ever have a, a, a clog in the drain here, you can actually snake it from here. Uh, you can snake toilets and showers directly and tubs through the drains, but you can also snake them from exterior cleanouts or the main sewer cleanout, which city requires one main sewer cleanout. It'll be in the, it'll be in the ground out front. 
you never want to bury those things in your landscaping but that is definitely one of those places that if you get a clog there it can cause back up all the way through everything into the home. Um, so this is the plumbing component of residential construction. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention, you can see how these vent stacks and things are going through two by fours. These metal plates are actually nail guards to make sure when someone's hanging dry roll, they're not gonna put a screw or a nail right through any of your, your plumbing supply or, um, or ventings. And that's another reason why they pressurize it with air first, the gas lines, and the plumbing, they pressurize with actual water. There's water in the pipe so that when they're hanging stuff, if they put a, a nail or a screw through it, they'll know. Next section, we're gonna talk about HVAC. In this segment, we're gonna talk about HVAC. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So here in Texas, real important, like I can't emphasize this enough as a homeowner, HVAC is probably right up there with we need water and food because living here eight or nine months out of the year, if you don't have conditioned air in the house, it's miserable. So we're back inside of this one. Right above me here, you'll see the entire heating and ventilation system that is in the attic, the portion in the attic. So you're looking at a couple of different boxes. So one portion of that is going to be bringing air to the system. So you have returns. So in the ceiling here, you see a large return. In multiple other areas of the home, you'll see supply lines. So you see supply vents and you see they're blue taped right now to keep dust and debris out, but they also pressure test these things to make sure there are no gaps in the system when they install them. And they try to do it early when nothing else is in the way and it makes it a lot easier for them to uh, you know, work around people. Uh, and these things are generally, they will apply these very specific calculations because most of these builders are building to an energy uh, sense rating or an energy star rating. They get these HERS ratings and it helps to define and show people that the home will live cooler and it will be cleaner because of how they are filtering the air and how they're bringing it fresh air in because these homes are being foam sealed and they're kind of tight. So you want to make sure you're getting that hot humid air out the, and clean. Make sure you're not bringing in dirty air. So supply in the house, You'll also have supplies in secondary areas like not just, hey, we're giving you air, but some areas will have a return as well. So they'll have what they call jump ducts in bedrooms. In this game room, you just have two supply vents. But the location of those is dictated by that contractor and those very specific, you know, it's computer generated formulas now. They take the elevation of the house they determine how many windows it has, they look at what direction it faces, and they make sure that they're placing those supply and returns in the proper area for the home so that the home will live as cool as possible and run efficiently. So back to the main system in the attic, what you're gonna see up there is where all the air goes into the system and then it comes across the coil and then it hits a plenum and then it gets distributed to all of the uh, supply ducts. So again, Big return, takes the air in, brings it across the coil, and then it gets distributed all over the house to the different rooms and areas. And again, those locations are dictated by a computer program based on each individual floor plan. They also are able to calibrate what size unit you need and so forth. Now, the outside component is not installed on this home yet, and they do that for a couple of reasons. One. Uh, the side between the fence, the property line, and the house is only about six or seven feet on this particular plan. Uh, some of them get as tight as five feet. In those outdoor condensing coils, those are kind of big. They're full of copper, so they're worth a lot of money. And then what brings the refrigerant or what runs the system through, they generally will have copper lines that come into the house and then tie into the unit in the attic. Uh, the other part of HVAC heating, same thing. You have your furnace upstairs. The, it's heated by gas. So that gas furnace heats the air, the system, the blower, distributes the air throughout the home. Other parts of HVAC 
uh, consists or what those contractors are also going to put in are things like the fresh air intake. So here's an example of a, a framing chase in the corner where they're actually bringing fresh air into the system. So they're not just recirculating condition air. I'm in the hallway right outside of the family room going into the primary bedroom here. On the wall here is a uh, wire. It's brown coated. It has six or eight separate colored wires inside. This is for the thermostat. These homes come with smart thermostats. Uh, this home also, I believe, is zoned. I could see a baffle up there, but because it's a one story and there's no attic stairs, I can't get to it. Above my head, you'll see another one of the returns. And then as you move into the primary bedroom here, you'll see an example again of supply vents with an, again, an additional return. So when that primary bedroom door is closed at night, hot air naturally rises, it has a way to escape. And then you can still get air blowing in here to help cool it off and you're, you know, circulating the air in here. Another component of HVAC in these homes has to do with ventilation. So you don't only have supplies in bathrooms, but they will have vents that will be exhaust vents. So you will have an exhaust vent built in for like a water closet, uh, again, to circulate the air. You'll see an example of it here right outside the shower as well. That is a, an exhaust vent. And you'll see another here in the primary water closet. And then you'll see those exhaust vents again in the uh, secondary bathroom. You even have one in the utility room where you'll have a high humidity situation when you're running a closed washing machine and a dryer. You know, your ex and again, ventilation, your dryer vent. That's what this metal box is. This builder's using a pretty good product here. You see how the box is recessed into the wall? So your dryer can fit all the way up against the wall, and then you can connect your exhaust from the dryer up to the vent that then takes it up and out through the roof. Now, venting over a certain amount of distance, if it goes over 25 feet for a dryer, they normally require booster fans to help get that air out maintenance on that is making sure lint and things don't get built up and then you'll have a, a roof vent that'll have a, a catch on it so you'll know if you're getting lint in it you'll be able to see it through the roof that's something that it's a good idea to keep maintained because that could you know cause a fire all right let's talk about a slab so house stands up on a slab this is what it looks like before they do anything you take a blank piece of land you bring in fill dirt, you level it off, you compact it, you make a nice flat base for yourself. Once it's been compacted over time, depending if you have to water it in or not, then you can start building from there. The next thing that would happen is they would bring out some wood material, set forms, the exterior of the slab, and then they'd start digging the trenches, setting up the poly, making sure the plumbing and any electrical coming through the slab is in place, and then getting the post-tension cable set. Here's what a finished slab is gonna look like. So this one has the form boards that have been removed. You can see the cement is cured and they're basically ready to start building here. What you're seeing out the side here and you'll see along the back, those are the post tension cables. These cables run throughout the slab. They run on top of the pads. They run in the valleys, the trenches, the beams of the slab, and they are tension. They put, they use pneumatic, machine and the the best way to describe it is imagine the cables 20 feet long they stretch it to like 25 feet they put that much pressure and pulling on it to give it the tensile strength that way the whole slab basically moves together all right it's what we use in our area it's not the only way to build a slab it is less expensive yes that's probably why builders use it but it is quick and it does help especially with the type of expansive soils we have in the Houston area. So some of the other components you'll see on this slab is the metal sticking out of it. This particular builder along with every other one is gonna use these sill pieces. That's in the slab, it's poured, it cures in there. When they put the sill plate down for the bottom of the wall, they're then going to bend that over and nail into each one of those eight holes to tie the frame to the slab. Other components are these. So these are provided by a company called Simpson Strong Ties. Uh, and I like to call them the, the clips and straps of a home. This metal is code required 
in most areas in Houston. You get closer to the coast, you'll have way more requirements for metal. But these will be bent up and then will be affixed to the frame. And you'll see them at crucial points, generally at corners. The frame will also get secured down to the slab by drilling and putting bolts. Again, provided probably by Simpson. These bolts can be anywhere from 6, 8, 12, 18, 24 inches. They drill through the base plate. They drill into the slab. They hammer that in and then they tighten it down. That way, again, it makes it all one. They're taking slab to frame to roof, making it all connected. We're going to cover how the slab gets formed up in another section. So to continue with slabs, I'm standing in the middle of one. You can see form boards have been set, and what they've done next is the plumbing. These are the next steps. So they have set the forms, the outside of the slab. They've leveled it. They made sure it's at the height they need it to be. They haven't done the internal drop downs yet. That comes later. What they've done though then is dug for plumbing. And you'll notice basically they dig one big trench, trench right from the front. There's your main sewer line that's going to take everything out. Your main water supply line also runs from the front where the meter is and it takes it to the side of the house and then it'll be tied into the home. All of the things you see sticking out here have to do with plumbing, its drainage, and venting. You will also see a blue conduit. That blue conduit is where they will run electrical wiring through a wall, an interior wall of the home. That way it'll get to an island area, likely in the kitchen. This is all that goes in before they come back, do inspections, fill it back in, compact it before they move to the next station. So here's where a slab goes next. So after plumbing's been put in, you can see where the plumbing's protruding through, but you can now see where they've dug the trenches, they've set each pad, they've wrapped it in poly. You can see that the post tension cables have been set. You can see the plastic cat eye things that are keeping the, keeping the cables up off the pads. That way concrete will get up and under. Concrete will go into each one of these channels around the pads. And then you can start seeing as you get into these channels, you can see where the cables are running. You can see the additional structural rebar and metal, the angle iron we discussed that was piled up on the other lot. You can also start seeing where the Simpson strong tie material is being temporarily nailed in place with the form material. You can see where the sill material still hasn't uh, been installed yet, but they get set when they're pouring the concrete. You can see all the forms are set, and then you can see how the internal forms have been set. So you can see where the garage will be poured and how it steps down. You can see the porch that is stepped down. You can see where the tub bucket is and where the shower pan is and where it will be set. You can also see this poly material goes up and down. You can see the red tape that's taping separate pieces together. They're trying to get a good vapor barrier there. Cement, it's a, it's a hot process. There's a curing process if it's too hot outside. Matter of fact, they won't pour a slab here in our area unless it's 45 degrees and rising. The cooler it is, the longer it'll take it to cure. But in the dead of summer of 100 degree heat days, they're out here with sprinkler systems watering these slabs and making sure that the curing process takes the time it needs because if it dries too fast, it might not be as uh, structurally sound or rigid as they want. Some of the other things you'll see are portions of the slab material. Again, the forms have been done, but you see how they get capped up. That's where your brick ledge will be. Um, and then, in, you know, the concrete then steps up again in other sections of the form. Uh, again, you can see the structural metal. You can see the, the grounding rod is a great thing you can see now because with the electrical component, you can see where that metal rebar is sticking up out of the, the um, edge of the slab material here. And you can see how it curves down and it runs all the way to here. So that grounding rod terminates right here, about four feet from the edge of the garage, runs all the way, does a 90 and goes up and it sticks out of the slab about two feet. So that is definitely at least a 20 foot piece of rebar, 15 to 20 feet. So that's a pretty long rod. And then the one that'll get added on the outside of the slab to secure is nailed down several feet as well. I can't remember what the requirement was for that rod. So this is the final stage of slab before probably an inspection. 
before they're going to move forward with a pour of the concrete. Now I'm on the slab, I want to show a couple of the components so you can see where plumbing's coming through. This is mostly going to be drains. You also will see electrical, this blue conduit with that metal rod right there. There's probably electricity going to the island. That is going to run to an exterior wall somewhere and they'll feed the electricity through the framing wall and it'll be routed to that island. You see the recess areas, you got garages, the car stop, you can see how it's lower. You can see this area here, this is the, the, the shower bucket for the primary bathroom, has a sunken shower. You can see the tub bucket next to it, that's where their tub drain will be. You can see again toilets and, and again the vent stacking to vent the sewer off gassing. You can see recessed areas in the back here as well. This is also like a rear covered patio. And then you have like an internal courtyard patio kind of off the side here, which was probably off of the primary bedroom in this plan. So this home also is sitting with four car garage. You can see a, a 16 foot section here, door. You can see an eight there, so that's three. And then there's a fourth there with a side entry. So as the driveway comes up, you'll have two doors facing the street and one that'll be facing to the side. This is a great example of a post-tension cable slab when stuff goes wrong. So when they're pouring these slabs, different trucks are, are bringing the cement in. And as they pour them from the truck directly, they keep a map of where, you know, truck number one dumped their material. As you can see, the slab is being finished, but as we get to the front here, it is really jacked up. You're seeing all the aggregate material. You can see that they didn't smooth it out or work it like they normally would do a finish on a slab. As I saw this, I said, well, let me go take a look, a closer look at it. And I noticed something that it looks like as they were pouring these last sections here, someone did what they probably uh, classify as like a slump test or a material test to see if the aggregate and the cement mix and all the other components that go into the concrete before they pour it uh, was good and i guess it failed because they basically just stopped working at a certain point they finished pouring it and then you'll notice that they drilled a couple of holes into the slab and you can see these two core holes right here and i'm pretty sure there's a few other as they are spread around the material and what they've done is they've come and take took a core sample and they brought it back to test it to see if it was a problem with the mix of the concrete the only reason a builder's doing that is because they're pointing the blame at someone someone either put too much water they put too much of another material into it and it has caused this slab to what i'm gonna guess is going to be torn out and thrown away and they're gonna have to start over again that's a costly mistake but it is definitely something that a builder of any quality they want to make sure the quality control is kept and unchecked and they want to make sure their vendors are kept to a higher standard than they deliver what they're supposed to In this part of the series, we're going to talk about electrical. Again, I'm in a home under construction. It's not fully uh, installed, but a majority of the components are here before cover up. So we're going to start here at the main breaker panel. So the electrical service comes in from the service provider from the back of the house, and it has an underground that comes up and into the service panel. It's located in the garage. But while this is uncovered, you can see portions that you never really get to see of the electrical system. So number one, there's a ground rod. So the grounding rod here, that piece of rebar goes into the slab for a, a certain amount of feet. So it goes down and it is bent and it's run in the, in the, the beam of the slab. And then there is a grounding rod in its acorn clamp style attached and that takes it to the grounding of the panel and then there is an additional grounding rod on the outside of the home that connects the panel and goes in and that grounding rod is nailed into the ground again another acorn style clamp is connecting it this is where all the breakers and everything will be and from this main hub the electricity is then disseminated throughout the house and you can see how they're bringing wire into the panel in and out from both sides. And you'll notice that they have sent them through each individual grommet. The code requires them to separate it. Not every municipality requires it. This city does its own independent uh, inspections. So they're really adamant about making sure they're stapled appropriately, making sure they're safely placed in the studs far enough back. And if they're not, then they're gonna put nailer plates. Matter of fact, you could see some nailer plate examples here 
where they're making sure no one's going to be able to put a nail or a screw through these wires, okay? Depending on the gauge of the wire, they're required because of their proximity to the edge. I think best practice, just put a nail or guard on the whole thing, and I'm pretty sure the city's going to make them do it. You also can see how they're being run separate pipe, and then again, separate holes, and they're going, and they're being spread throughout the home. Another component of the electrical system here are for future uses. So this orange tube's actually installed by the electrician, along with other low voltage style wiring, like for a garage door opener. So you can see these blue boxes. One's an electrical for the garage door opener to plug into. The other one is for the beams that go across the garage door. So you'll see one here in a box, and you'll see this one that is firmly not in a box, but coming straight through here. So this one will be connected to the electric beam that goes from one side to the other. It's a safety feature. So a kid or, you know, the door won't crush something. Uh, other components of electrical include plugs, switches. So you can see that they're all being installed at certain heights. You'll see where they've marked. So this is a switch for the above light. This here is for the garage door switches. You'll have a button here to open and close your doors. There'll be two because there's two separate doors. Other components in here, again, electrical plugs. So in a garage, it's uh, considered a wet area because it's outside. All these plugs will be GFCI protected. Code requires AFCI breakers in the panel along with the GFCI plug. So bathrooms, garages, front porch, exterior plugs, soffit plugs for Christmas lights will all be GFCI protected. Uh, again, you'll have your ceiling light mounts, again, garage doors, uh, and as you move into the home, you'll start seeing other structured wiring components as well as electrical. So you're still doing switches and plugs, but you'll also have things like, what I can see here is gonna be under cabinet lighting and over cabinet lighting. You can see where there are uh, certain ones for like a fridge. You can see where you'll have plugs in your backsplash. You also have the electrical run to the island. So you can see they ran it through a conduit, a pipe right here in the slab, and that they, they left themselves plenty of slack so that they can run it where they need. There'll probably be a plug on either end of the island. And you're also gonna have a dishwasher and a disposal here in the island. Um, some of the other plug electrical things you'll see in here are gonna be like this 220 box. You see this heavy gauge wire. This is for likely the double oven. Okay, this one is a gas cooktop, so you're going to have electrical over there as well. But you can see that they ran that 220 here for the double oven. But some builders, and this one is one of them, it looks like they did not. Some will run the 220 just in case somebody wants to go to uh, a, a, an electrical cooktop in the future. Because trying to run that later, you're going outside the house. You can't really get behind cabinets in the walls. Uh, some other things that are installed by the electrician are the other structured wiring things. This builder does not run wire for alarms. Most alarm companies have gone wireless for their entry point detectors, but they do run, again, pull tubes for future use. So like TV components, if you wanna put a TV over your fireplace, that conduit runs up and over and you'll be able to run wiring from the back of the TV you can keep component boxes. If you still use DVDs, you got that. You can run a cable box, a satellite box. Uh, it's also useful if people are using, um, you know, internet TV, they can have their component box here, or some people are using PCs, laptops to fuel their watching needs at home. It's all there. You got your electrical up top as well. Uh, some of them will be running speaker wire. Here in this house, I have not seen a speaker wire, but they will run that low voltage uh, wiring for speakers. Again, speakers are going wireless, but some people still want hard wire for them. Uh, other components that the electrician will run that are not just plugs and switches, they're going to install light fixtures. So we do have can lighting that's been installed already here in the entryway. There are several in the family room ceiling. You're going to see it in a lot of the bathroom areas. A majority of the home is going to be can lights uh, in new construction now. but. Here in this one, you'll have some hung fixtures like over the island. You'll have a few ceiling fans. Um, here's a good one that some people really don't realize. When you want to put up a ceiling fan 
or when you want to hang a light fixture, you need to make sure that it's that the it can hold it. So right here, you'll see a light fixture in the ceiling. It's just a small round box. That is not going to hold a heavy light fixture. That's going to hold a two to seven, 10 pound ceiling mount fixture. But if you want to hold a ceiling fan that can be upwards of 20 to 30 pounds, you're going to need a box like this. And you'll notice it's like a tension box. So it's a metal box. It's not plastic. It stretches between the framing members and that box can be slid along that, that metal uh, line there. So you can adjust it to fit your need. And that's rated to hold ceiling fans or heavier fixtures. Now, if you have much heavier fixtures, like a chandelier, a big thing for an entryway, a dining room, an older version, heavy glass, you really wanna make sure you find out what they're using or what they did use to see if it'll accommodate it or not. Here you can see where the electrical supply service is being provided. You can see the trench that's been dug and you can see it goes down. It probably needs to be at least 18 inches down. I'm not, follow, I don't know the specific RC code or what the city of Katy requires, but you can see it's coming from the rear of the property. It's coming from a supply box that's probably in the neighbor's yard. Those two smaller ones are not electrical. Um, and they're bringing it down the side of the home. They're bringing it into, a, it's in a conduit. It comes all the way up and it comes up to this 90 and it comes up and there's the supply line. You can see the green tag here where they've been inspected. It's been approved. It has not been hooked up yet because when the power company hooks that up, then they'll set the meter can box on the home. What they're gonna do is probably set a temporary meter on the outside here to supply service to the house while it's under construction. You can also see the external ground rod that I mentioned uh, in another portion of the video. And again, you can see what an acorn style clamp looks like. And you can see that that rod has been driven well into the ground. And then this is tying it inside to the grounding rod that is installed in the slab that also is affixed with an acorn style clamp. And all of that goes to the panel that's on the other side of this wall. And you'll see how that will carry through. Okay. So I'm going to just go through a list of other things that are tied into all these systems in a home. So as I'm standing here on the side of the house, I'm looking at a hose bib. So, you know, you screw your hose in it, wash your car, water your grass, so forth. Uh, we have this uh, barrier here. This is the exterior sheathing to our frame. All right. What you then have on top of that are brick ties. This home's going to have brick and stone in places. So as they are stacking that brick, as they get to levels, they start bending these out, making sure that they're incorporated into the mortar and the brick. And that helps keep the brick affixed to the house. That's the only thing that kind of ties the brick to the house. It's sitting on a slab. So it sits on this uh, poly material at the bottom. This barrier is on top of that, that poly material runs up. That way if water makes it through the brick and the mortar, and mortar is cementious, so it is, you know, it's got holes, water can soak through. The water gets to the vapor barrier, which is sealed. It rolls down, hits the poly, comes out what they put in brick in weep holes to allow water a mode of egress. Uh, other components on the side here, you can see where the pull tubes from outside. This is for service providers, so like internet, phone, satellite providers, you need to get wires into the house. You go in here and these wires go up into the attic. So they have some that are pre-run and then you have additional tubes with pulls to be able to get more. This is actually where the gas meter is going to be located. That's what a gas meter will look like. And you can see how it ties into the house. This is what it looks like when there's no brick on a house. So large gas line, gas meter, gas gets supplied, comes up, goes in. You can see the electrical bonding here. They're bonding all the electrical to the home, the metal pipe that's required. Uh, these are discharge pipes for the hot water furnace or uh, or the tankless heater to make sure if something goes wrong with the temperature, pressure, and release, that water has a way to get out. And if you have water ever dripping out of these pipes, again, these aren't finished. They're normally going to have 90s on the end, point them down because hot water being dispelled from a house would be dangerous, plumbing straight out. Um, you can see where the AC unit, the outsole condenser coil, will be installed, and that's where wiring and the copper lines and everything will be running in and out of the house. Those metal boxes, again, are affixed to the frame. They flash around it, they tape around it, they make it watertight. That way you can run things in and out of the house without opening up the home's envelope. 
you'll see these metal pipes here. This is venting. Again, one's from the kitchen vent over the cooktop. This one right here, and what I'm, I'm thinking is this is actually for the uh, tankless water heater that'll probably be installed in the garage there. You can see that brown box with electrical wiring. That's an outside plug. This builder uses a pretty good product. So that box is recessed. So when it gets brick, that box kind of sits flush with the brick. So that when you plug something into that box, you open a cover, plug it in, there's a knockout on the bottom so that you can then close the cover and prevent water from getting anywhere near the plug. Plus the plug sits back about four and a half inches from the edge. So it's pretty hard for water to get in there if that thing's set up properly and closed. Uh, other items on the side of the house that we can see here, you can see a sewer clean out. Again, that's for the kitchen that's coming right from the island where the uh, sink's located. So some other components while we're on the side of the house here, soffit and fascia material, all hardy plank. You can see the windows and you can see how they're flashed around with tape. You can also see how they've taped all the seams where the two pieces of four by eight material meet. It adds, again, a, wall, a vapor barrier. Some builders use materials that's a foam board that adds a little bit of an insulation value, but this builder's using an exterior two by six wall, so they're gonna put a little higher level of bat insulation in the wall. I'm gonna take you to see a few other components that tie all of these systems together. A few other uh, optional systems or things that tie all these systems together in a house uh, right here, you're gonna see they're plumbing for an outdoor kitchen. Some builders will pre-plumb for it and you can finish it yourself or they're likely gonna build this one out. You can see the gas supply line for the grill and you can see they've plumbed it with hot and cold water and they're ready for a sink as well. GFCI protected outlet again built in right here and you see how it's being built in low. So that's why I think that they have designed this so that someone can build around it at a later date. Uh, you also see a better example of how they flash and tape around windows. So you see how they seal it down each side. You can see how they uh, flash across the top with the Tamil tape uh, and tambling tape. And then, you know, it's really tacky. And if it's done right, you shouldn't have issues, but you really should have inspections done and they will come back and seal up creases or rips. Uh, and you also notice at the top of the window, there's optional flashing. Most manufacturers do not include that automatically, but that is something you should do over each window. So there's metal flashing that goes up and under that tape flashing. So as water rolls down, it doesn't ever make contact with the actual window frame. It hits that flashing, comes out. And because there's brick or stone, and this one's gonna be brick, there will be a heavy metal brick lintel that runs on top of that flashing. And then they'll have weep holes there as well when it's finished. Um, you'll also see these two white pipes coming out the soffit. That is from the main AC unit. It's the secondary drain line. You ever see water coming out of one of those dripping like that? It means your primary drain line is clogged and you should have it serviced because you don't want that water backing up. But when it gets into that secondary pan, it's designed to be sloped and it brings the water outside. And they normally push it out a window so people will notice it. But if you keep your blinds closed, you might not see it, but again, if you ever see water dripping out of anything, obviously something's probably wrong. But high up like that, it's gonna be cooler water. It's not a hot water heater, it's not dangerous. It's just gonna be something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, some other optional things that you'll see on the outside of this one is, you'll see that there is a huge parallel beam carrying this huge patio span. And again, if you wanna go that big distance, you're gonna to need to use something that can hold the weight of that roof and the framing. They're using huge eight by eight cedar columns probably. They're wrapped, they'll be bricked around them. Again, you see the brick ties going up it, but they're sealing every aspect of this along the way to keep everything as watertight as possible. So that's many of the optional components that are in this home. Thank you for uh, watching my video uh, on the, you know, components that go into your home. Uh, I hope it was informative. Uh, I tried to be as, in, as all encompassing as I could be. I know I didn't cover everything perfectly, but if you have any uh, questions, leave some comments. I'd love for you to follow the channel. And if there's other things you want to hear me talk about, I'd be happy to put videos together about those. Thanks again for watching. This is Charlie Russo, Remax Signature.